It's Wednesday, August 7th. I'm Matt Harmon. Welcome to the Yahoo Fantasy Football Show. It is a hell of a day to talk ball. And joining me to do just that somehow for the first time on this particular podcast, on any podcast that I've done, is 4 for 4's John Paulson, the director of forecasting. Hell of a title, John, uh, and, and hell of a good time to have you on the show today, buddy. What's going on? Yeah, I was able to give myself my title, so I went big. Yeah. Uh, why not, right? Uh Thanks for having me on, Matt. Uh, this is the first time I've been on your show, and I think this is, unless I'm misremembering, the first time I've been on any Yahoo show, which is really an indictment of Andy Barron's, who's one of my longest yeah. friends in this industry. But he comes on my pod all the time. You come on my pod, pod all the time, so I think that's probably where we do our catch-up. Well, listen, anytime we can blame Andy Barron's for something yeah. behind his back, on a show that there is a 0.0% chance he will listen to, we should absolutely do that. So I'm happy that you threw Andy under the bus. I'm, I'm totally in favor of that move. And yeah, this is the first time um, we've talked on my show. John and I do an annual catch up on his show about the wide receiver position, about reception perception. So I'm going to try to save some of those topics. I know that we'll hit on on John's show. So definitely make sure uh, you're subscribed and, and, and we'll be promoting that as it comes up. But we do have a very particular task here today, John Paulson, because it's rankings week here on the podcast. And John it was someone that I wanted to get on for this show for, for rankings week because John actually um, is good at making fantasy football rankings. And that's sort of the ethos of this show today. If you guys listen to the show, you know I rail on fantasy rankings every now and again and how they can sort of be a, a limited piece of the pie, which I know we will discuss again in a little bit. But John is actually good at this thing. He was a 10-time top 10 accuracy finisher from 2010 to 2021. So the qualifications are there. Uh, and I also know he thinks about it in a in a real way, not just how can I game the system to to get the accuracy points and all that stuff. Uh, he's legit taking a lot of components in. So we will break that down in full on today's show. But before that, got to do a little programming note for your life here, people. Sign up for a Yahoo Fantasy Football League. It's August. It's time. If you haven't already, I truly wonder what you are doing with yourself at this stage of the calendar. If you're listening to this podcast, you should be playing a fantasy football league on Yahoo. I'll give you one more reason, if that's not good enough, if shaming you is not good enough. Yahoo Sports and NBC are teaming up for a $1 million sweepstakes this year. Here's how you enter it. You sign up for a private Yahoo Fantasy Football League and draft your team. You were going to do that anyways. Great. Now, if any of the players you start on your team scores a touchdown in the week one games on NBC and Peacock, you're going to earn bonus entries into the sweepstakes. Each person can earn up to eight entries, one just for signing up, and then up to seven more for touchdowns scored in those three games. We got the like Ravens, the Chiefs, the, the Packers, the Eagles, the Lions, the Rams. That's a lot of potential touchdowns. So get to drafting. Deadlines for entries is September 5th. Visit yahoo.com slash fantasy million to join. Speaking of drafting, it is the, the time of the month, when the time of the year when people are drafting. People are going to be drafting all month long. John Paulson, that's why each week, here in August, we have a central theme. As I mentioned, this is Rankings Week, and today we are focused on how to make good fantasy football rankings. John Paulson, no pressure, but people need to know, how do you actually make good rankings? So I want to just first dive into sort of your process in putting together your rankings. Um, how how much are you tweaking throughout the offseason? When do you really start this thing? I know you de de detailed projections as well, so kind of give us the 10,000 foot view on ranking fantasy football players via John Paulson's brain. Uh, sure. So when I first won the fantasy pros accuracy contest, uh, it was back in 2010. I was just simply ranking players in order of how I would um, start them that week or how I would draft them in the, in the preseason. Uh, and then I came over to four for four. Uh, Josh Moore hired me a year or two after that win. And I kind of saw, what their system was, which was built long before Josh, uh, but it, it's a top-down system. Uh, so I think that's the way you have to go for both weekly and for for draft rankings. I believe our discussion today is primarily on draft rankings. So our process, just speaking generally, not to give sauce away, a special sauce sure. away. Uh, we we start with win totals. The, I do. I, I'm a lot more heavy-handed in the draft rankings. Uh, Especially with the like the team projections, um, 
I, I have kind of gone off. I'm done my own process with the draft rankings, whereas the weekly rankings, it's very much the same as you know when I mm. got to four for four. So um, I look personally at uh, all the different changes at play caller, offensive coordinator. Uh, I'm looking at their number of plays that they run per game, uh, their pass run splits. And that kind of gets me a baseline projection along with the team win totals because we have some equations that will help with that. And then I get into each quarterback. So, you know, if the quarterback's the same, the offensive coordinator is the same, it's pretty easy to come up with the team level projections. Uh, if the quarterback's changed or it's a rookie or it's a, it's a new play caller that's coming from college, there's quite a bit more work that has to go into try to get that first baseline uh, team projection. And once those team projections are done, I'll have, you know, all the passing yards, passing touchdowns, et cetera. I'll go through each team and I'll look at their 2023 distributions. And when I say distributions, I'm talking about percentage of rushing yards, percentage of rushing touchdowns, passing passing yards, uh, passing uh, receiving yards, receptions, et cetera, and divvy up all those team stats uh, based on what I believe those players will do uh, this year, uh, looking forward to 2024. 2023 is the starting point on the distribution front. And then by the time that's all done, I press a button and I have rankings and that you, that first set of rankings is usually pretty wild. Um, but I'll go through and I start to go through each position, start to think about, okay, why is this guy this high? I don't feel comfortable with that. Okay. What are the things I didn't take into account? Maybe in the team projection level, got to move him down due to injury uh, or, you know, fading play uh, age, et cetera. And then by the time that process is done, I'm ready to release my initial set of projections. But I think the underlying uh, thing is it has to be, to me, top down, starting with team level, then getting into player level. Uh, for us, especially because our, our projections drive just about everything on the site, um, mm -hmm. we are, we're able to, with a full set of projections, provide customized uh, rankings for each type of league like there's some wacky scoring systems out there uh, users can import their league get customized rankings for each position uh, in the uh, top 200 as well uh, and i think that's the way to to do it for us because um, it allows our projections to be you know used with all this, all these different types of scoring systems if you just are ranking and just sliding players around which is people do that and that's fine um, but the, the numbers don't add up. So you get some yeah. situations where, uh, we're going to talk about a few today where I, I can't literally rank the players where they're going in ADP unless I give the quarterback 5,000, 6,000 yards passing. Uh, so I think it makes the, th the whole thing more accurate, uh, because the numbers have to add up. And that means you have to make some choices on some players. And I believe we'll talk about that today. Yeah, a hundred percent. I love the top down sort of perspective on this because that when I do my projections, that is where everything starts to. And and it's funny because you really and, and I'm curious how you bake in sort of these ambiguous depth charts and ambiguous situations, because for me, what I, when I first did projections, which I think was probably around the 2017, maybe 2018 season was the first time I really like sat down and did it. You just forget how many random players end up picking up targets throughout the year. Uh, sometimes they're not even guys that are on the depth chart or or running back carries. Obviously, that's really difficult. You know, for example, you know Leonard Fournette signs with the Bills in the middle of last year. Not that he ever had a, a real significant role, but th those are some of those ambiguous situations that I think you when you sit down and, and do projections, you get reminded of. Okay, yeah, you can't just give the top three receivers twenty plus percent of the targets because there's going to be some fourth or fifth guy, God forbid, getting a, a significant amount of volume here. So in some of those ambiguous wide receiver cores, running backs, everything, sort of how do you try to take that into context when we're when we're coming into the year? Yeah, so you, you always get some really weird names at the end of the year, uh, you know, catching three passes for 48 yards. I don't, I don't think that those the players... The Washington Commanders had like 10 <laughs> of them last year. <laughs> I don't think for fantasy and our purposes that matters a whole lot, although mm -hmm. you don't, and I've noticed this the last few years. Um, you you don't want because all the all the prop betting that's going on. So that's a whole other factor that has entered my life uh, mm. with prize picks and you know DraftKings and you know others. Uh, 
where people are doing season long prop betting and they're they're looking at my projections and saying, okay, you know, you're too high on this guy, you're too low on this guy. So what I what I've done in the last few years is really take into account missed games. Uh, I did a missed game study for each position, and I basically apply that unless the unless the player has a long injury history or no injury history. I basically apply those numbers pretty blanket to the to the positions. So, for example, uh, I'm expecting the average running back to uh, play 13.8 games. Mm. Um, so, and I've got the other numbers as well, obviously. So that allows our top 200 to be a little bit more uh, accurate because now we're taking into the positional dependability between running backs and receivers and tight ends. Um, and so getting into the uh, distributions for a specific team, applying those sorts of missed games expectations to Jamar Chase or to uh, Zach Moss, if we're just going to, let's talk about the Bengals, that opens, that frees up stats for the rest of the depth chart. So um, like Chase Brown's getting some, and then the next guy's getting some, and then we get some goofballs that, you know, as a as a fantasy guy that does not watch much college football, we got rookies coming in I've never heard of. I got to figure sure. out how to say their say their name, but I'm giving them a few carries and a few catches. Uh, so that sort of sorts itself out with that aspect of the projections. Um, and I think it 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 when you look at the prize picks and everything, you know, betting season long unders is is usually a winner. Because there's so many different ways, you know, a player misses two or three games, he's not going to hit the the line. I don't know where they're getting some of these these lines. Um, I don't know. I don't, we probably shouldn't get too deep into prize picks, but that has, sure. I think, you know, talking with Connor Allen, our betting guy, and, and uh, Ryan Noonan, that has um, been the one thing lately that has really allowed me to provide some stats to these goofballs that are on the depth chart, and you know, RB four, RB fives. Because they are going to get in for a carry or two, or they may play quite a bit, depending if there's an injury to their, uh, you know, RB one or RB two in that on that team. Uh, I think they get a lot of the lines because uh, it's it's not fun to bet season long unders. People don't people don't want to do that. And like oh, right. this this guy seven hundred yards, no problem, no big deal. But as you mentioned, chaos is the one driving and consistent force of the NFL. So a lot of things can happen even if you have a, a guy totally nailed from a talent perspective, you have the situation nailed, one thing leads to another, you know, and and, and it can really be a, a something that falls apart from that season long under perspective. Um you mentioned that your rankings, your projections are not going to come out looking like ADP. Uh we know that generally certain sites, certain ADPs are going to you know, fluctuate one way or another. Obviously, you know, you're doing best ball drafts. That's going to be really wide receiver heavy. You're doing drafts here on Yahoo, uh, which, as I mentioned at the top, obviously you should be doing if you haven't done it yet. What what are you doing with your life? Um, that's going to be a little more traditional running back uh, heavy structure, even if it's also moving wide receiver heavy. My question about this is is essentially when situations come out in your projections that don't look like ADP, how do you adjust that then in your rankings? Because a lot of those times, those situations, I mean, we'll just say Texans wide receivers. Let's talk. We, we can be specific about the Texans. We can be general about the Texans. But I wrote this in my projections article that no matter what, uh, if you're doing projections the right way, you are not going to get all those Texans wide receivers to be top 30 receivers unless CJ Stroud is going to have a historic season, which is within the range of outcomes. I would argue he could have that type of season, but you're not going to project it that way. So. How do you use your projections and your rankings to sort of say, like, no, we don't want you to stay away from this situation, but we also have to sort of advise a little more uh, caution than ADP might be reflecting? Uh, well, I I was able, yeah, and I agree with the sentiment. And uh, when I was when I think about these receiver situations, or when I say that um, that you can't, the numbers have to add up. I'm thinking about Nico Collins at ADP 13, uh, Stefan Diggs at ADP whatever it is, 22, 23, Tank Dell at 25. So I just for example, I have uh Nico at I love Nico Collins and I loved your write up on him uh for reception perception. Like he is a really good route runner. He's really developing into what perhaps a star receiver. Wide receiver 13 is really tough mm-hmm. given his splits with just Tank Dell uh last year. They were basically scoring at the same rate last year when they both played. And uh, now you're throwing Stefan Diggs, who is a known target hog, into the mix. So, yes, to have all three ranked in the top 25, I would put it at 25. It's very difficult. You have to have uh, uh, Stroud throwing for 5,000 yards and you know 38 touchdowns or something. Uh, 
So I have uh, Nico at 20. I've got Dell at like 23 or 24, and I've got Diggs at 28. And that, and I do have them at all, all in the top 30. I managed that, mm-hmm. and I can show you the, how the numbers add up. That's basically at the expense of Dalton Schultz. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> poor Dalton. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. So uh, that is, but I also think that adds an element of accuracy to the projections because this is real. It's something that could happen in real life. Whereas if if I'm just ranking and I'm just putting in, put the, putting these players where I want them, then those guys all could be higher, and they might be worth the ADP. So we we try to trust, and I talk about it in my draft day strategy article. I say, you know, there are, this is these are mean projections, and you know, if you want Stefan Diggs, if you believe in Stefan Diggs as the third third receiver there, he might be the second. He might end up being the first. I think he's the third, uh, due to the built in rapport that Stroud has with both Nico Collins and Tank Dell, and how productive they were with him. And Diggs is kind of coming in and in the kind of not the twilight of his career, but at the back end of his career. You know, I don't know that he's going to come in and be the alpha that he has been in Buffalo for the several years. So, I trust, or I put some, I try to put some trust in the uh, users and say, look, if you like Diggs, pull the trigger here. He's worth his ADP, perhaps, but you have to be prepared for disappointment because the way I see it is Collins one, Dell two, or very you know one A one B, and Diggs after them. I think this actually transitions us really well into our um, one of the last things I want to talk about from a philosophical perspective, which is how to how to show range of outcomes with your rankings. Um, like I think we did this topic in in Fantasy University here on Yahoo, like the series on the site that we did, and I was asked the question, you know, how do you show range of outcomes in in a linear set of rankings? You can't. You, I, I think it's re- you can't do it. Uh, you can you can do tiers. Uh, you can you can kind of get into the range of outcomes with that, but that's not a perfect science. And, and using this Texans situation as an example, when I did my projections, yeah, Nico Collins didn't come out to wide receiver 14. I still ended up ranking him there, even if I think that's aggressive, because I think the what we've seen from Nico Collins already shows that he could, in in a chaos-driven situation, outkick that. You know, What if Stefan Diggs has taken a, a significant step back when he was already a declining player last year on film? What if Tank Dell gets hurt again? You don't want to miss that upside because I still think from a floor perspective, Nico's probably not that bottom's not going to drop out just because he's the X receiver attached to CJ Stroud. So I try to show that from a tiers perspective and then, you know, maybe even putting digs maybe a little higher than I probably would have projected him out to be just because, again, what, what if what if Tank Dell gets hurt? Then Stefan Diggs is just a clear cut number two receiver. So I don't know, John, for that, that's sort of how my brain works with these what if situations using this one in particular. But how do you kind of try to uh, show that to your viewers via like rankings? Is it just more so through analysis or is there any way to do it? Yeah, it's through analysis. I think there are perhaps ways to do it in rankings. I think it would be a very complicated process to show uh, your, your player and then show, okay, he's, he's projected for 185 fantasy points. And then you've got a range of 165 to, you know, 208. Yeah. Uh, and so then you could, you could sort of do that. I wouldn't know off the top of my head how to even come up with the range that, you know, it almost have to be, uh, he's got more upside. He's got less upside. He's got a higher floor. Um, he's got a lower floor. Uh, and I don't know how accurate that would be. It might look pretty, uh, but for us, it's 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 really about it's really about the context of the you know, of the player when you talk about. It. So I, I will I'll dra- write my draft notes that's on every player page, and it basically is my summation of my offseason study on that particular player. And for a player like Nico, the floor is probably higher uh, than a normal player ranked at wide receiver twenty for me. And then he also his ceiling is probably higher if there's any sort of injury because of the qu- qu- quality of quarterback play what he did last year, uh, you know, and, and just his overall arc as a, as a player. And I think that has to come through in the articles that you write or the podcast appearances you do, or, you know, your, your own podcast as you're talking about these players. And if, you know, my followers trust my take, they're consuming a lot of my content, they're going to get a feeling for, you know, who's got upside, who's got the higher floor, uh, and, and really, should I take, should I roll the dice on, on a player like this? And then, you know, Devon Achan is a, a great example of of this, you know, one of the most efficient, the most efficient runner last year. Incredible uh, per carry statistics. Got dinged up, 
Uh, but it's his first season. He ended up with like about 14 touches down the stretch with with Mostert, including the playoffs. The, his numbers are a little bit lower if you look at the whole season, but he had a ramp up time as a rookie. I would think that his floor, if healthy, is 14 touches. Mm-hmm. And if there's any growth to year two and it becomes 16, 17, he might have with his efficiency, even if it declines, might have RB1 overall upside. So I want to tout that. Uh, at least from a standpoint of anybody in the second or third round that wants to shoot the moon and shoot for a real upside guy, discuss that uh, with them and make sure you get to see the splits that happened in the last half of the season so that they know that it wasn't just 12 touches for for A-chan. It was 14 when things really settled in and they got into their 1-2 sort of, sort of split. And then you get into Mostert at 32 and his injury history, although he's been healthy the last couple seasons. Before that, he wasn't. What if What if he goes down? Then how many touches is a chance seeing? Yeah. So you talk about you, you talk about all these things throughout the the preseason. Luckily, the preseason lasts forever, and we can talk about pretty much every player ad nauseum. So everybody gets your take, and that's kind of how I have to do it because I think the trying to put ranges into the to the rankings would be extremely difficult. I think in summary, this big philosophical disqu- discussion we just had, and I'm and I'm kind of glad that it it went this direction because this is generally the way I'd like people to consume content. Everybody loves rankings, John. I'm sure you guys you, you guys track on your website what gets clicked on uh, the most. I know it gets clicked on at Yahoo the most. I know it gets clicked on at receptionperception.com the most. It's anything with rankings in the title. But it should not be like it, you look at the rankings and then that's it. Look at the rankings, log out. You know, Listen to the podcast, read the articles because it, I don't know, John, to me, rankings are... I don't even know if I want to call them the appetizer. I almost want to call them like the free bread that they've that, that they've got to get you just to hey, come come get this, dip it in the olive oil, you know, whatever. Maybe get a nice, uh, hopefully grass fed, good quality butter uh, on your on your roll, and that begins the meal. But there should be many more courses after just the rankings. I, I would agree with that, and I think that we expect that of our users to to dig in a little deeper. Now you can you can log in, you can look at the rankings if you want to put the bare minimum in. You, you know that I've done like 80, 85% of the work just ranking them in that order because that's oh, probably yeah. John, how. John's in the back kneading the dough. He's in, he's in the back making sure we're getting good locally sourced butter. He's yeah. making sure those are quality ingredients here. <laughs> and then if you just want to start them based on that or draft them based on that, that's fine. But if you're interested in this and this is a hobby and you'd want to just do, you know, do better than just being not the worst in your work league, then you put you you read a couple articles or you consume a few podcasts and you start to you know dig into okay I want this is my draft plan. If you start to create your own draft plan, now you're getting almost ninety five percent the way there because now you have your own risk tolerances that you're trying to narrow down. You have your own upsides and, and downsides and floors and what do you want and when do you want to get your quarterback and when do you want your tight end. You have all these philosophies that you start to get into and these things will repeat year after year to whereas you become a late round quarterback elite tight end guy. Who can pick up great mid round value at receiver because you subscribe to Reception Perception and you listen to the wide receiver deep dive that Matt Harmon and John Paulson do every summer. So that you put in a little bit of work. That's what we want. Uh, but we don't just expect you to just take the rankings and then leave. I mean, that's no fun. No, no fun at all. All right. Well, that was a fun uh, little appetizer course for us. Let's take a quick break and we get back. We're going to talk about some of the toughest teams to project some of the toughest players to rank this season right after this. All right, John, let's talk about some of the toughest teams to project, toughest players to rank this season. And let's start with the Chicago Bears wide receivers. Jacob Gibbs had a really good tweet about this this morning, actually. So this is very topical. He said, DJ Moore hasn't had a target share below 27.6 since 2020. Cole Komet hasn't had a target share below 17.7 since 2020. Keenan Allen's career target per route run rate is 26%. He's never been below 24.5% in a season. DeAndre Swift's target share in healthy games has never been below 10%. And he reached 15 and 18% during his time in Detroit. Oh, and by the way, Roma Dunze is a stud. You mentioned at the top, like, you, you want to go top down with these projections, John. Well, this is a brand new quarterback and a brand new offensive coordinator at least to this particular team so yeah john i can understand why it's really difficult to rank these bears receivers this season this is a crazy situation i I don't think we've ever seen a rookie 
quarterback, and maybe I'm mistaken, but to come into this weaponry. I mean, mm-hmm. no. D- DJ Moore, we've talked about him multiple times, you and I. Uh, Keenan Allen, we've talked about him multiple times, you and I. Uh, the interesting thing here, the wild card, is Keenan Allen to me because DJ Moore sort of is the you know the alpha. He's been there a while. Uh, and then Keenan Allen and uh, Roma Dunze, who, who is building that rapport with uh, Caleb Williams? Uh, this preseason and getting that trust. And I understand that, that Keenan Allen is in the same apartment complex or hotel as Caleb Williams. So we have some locker room uh, aspect that might be happening there. Some uh, some v- good vibes going on between those two. The thing, the, the problem I have with this offense specifically is Keenan Allen because yeah. he was like wide receiver two, wide receiver three on a per game basis last year. Incredibly productive. No drop off at all that I can see, and maybe you can speak to that as you know charting over at uh, reception perception. But and I always favor these. I have a soft spot in my heart for these aging receivers because I have cashed in on Larry Fitzgerald for years <laughs> when he's going in the eighth, ninth round, or whatever, and still playing at a high level. Uh, and then I'm not usually there for the drop off, but sometimes I am, and I'm like, okay, I needed to get out one year early, but there was yeah. no indication that it was going to happen. So uh, the, the, the tricky thing here, I think, is that it's not Caleb Williams' established uh, Bears quarterback that's been there three years, has his uh, rapport with DJ Moore uh, built in, and is now trying to learn Keenan Allen at Roma Dunze. It's a situation where anybody could become the wide receiver one of these three in terms of targets. Uh, probably won't be a Dunze just because they don't have to put that sort of pressure on him with DJ yeah. Moore and Keenan Allen on the roster. I think you know, the tight ends are probably going to be the losers here. Komet uh, takes a, a dip in his uh, targets. And they didn't they sign Gerald Everett as well? Yeah. Yeah. They even, uh, they even could play like some 12 personnel. 12, yeah. To. So, um, you know, I have more at 18, which I think is right on ADP. I was in a mock yesterday and I was like, I don't know if I like him at that point. I was kind of hoping he was get, would get taken. Uh, so I don't have to pull the trigger on, on more, even though I like him. I just don't know if he's going to live up to to that draft level. And then I have Keenan, who I'm more excited about Keenan at his ADP, which I think is 32. Uh, I've got him at 27. I think he's a target earner. And, and he, like, he might miss a couple games, but when he's available, he's pretty rock solid in terms of his targets. Now things might change because it's, it's going from the Chargers to the Bears. And then Adunze, I have him at 42. And the, the thing I wanted to, and this is, I think this is around ADP now as well, but when I when I initially released the projections, I believe, if I remember correctly, Adunze was much higher. He was going in the mid th- mid to high thirties, and has since dropped. I don't know rookie fever. If, yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's a lot of folks like me releasing our projections and you know people seeing them in the forties with Adunze and just understanding that it, the, the pie is only so big. So if you if you think that Adunze is a stud and you want to draft him, you pretty much have to bank on either an injury to to one of these two receivers or Caleb Williams having, you know, maybe the best passing season for a rookie of all time. I've got him at 16. I'm feeling pretty confident about him, but there's a lot of good quarterbacks. Um, I'm not, I'm not projecting him for 5,000 yards and 35 touchdowns. Yeah. I I've got Caleb Williams kind of in that tier of the back end QB ones, high end QB twos types. And that's a huge tier that, yeah. that, that, that can fluctuate on a given week, month by month, a lot of, lot of volatility there. Man, this receiver room is so difficult because all these three guys are are good, uh, and and they don't like you said they don't have an established rapport here. This isn't as if, yeah, we saw what DJ Moore did last year. It, it was awesome, but it was with a different quarterback and, and in a different offensive situation. So I'm not even sure that he's necessarily going to be deployed the same way. Uh, DJ Moore this year as he was last year. I think that could actually be good for him. Uh, he was used as pretty much a static vertical X receiver last year, which he can do that. He's really good at that, but. He can also be a player, I think, that is a bit more of a matchup nightmare, can be used in yards after catch situations. So maybe that is more of a fit with Caleb Williams. But again, that is a total um, bit of guesswork, total total projection. The thing with Keenan Allen that's tough for me is that I do think he – I think he's taken a step back the last couple of seasons from his peak. Uh, he's still a good player. You mentioned with age curves and wide receivers, you can, you can be very profitable if you continue to hang on. But it is definitely trying to catch a falling knife sometimes with with aging wide receivers because it it's 
I say it all the time, John, I'm sure we'll talk about it when we do a show together in a couple of weeks. It is the thing I'm least confident forecasting with reception perception is, is when the cliff happens because it's so different and it's so player by player. The, the, the problem with Keenan, though, is I do think he needs to win from the slot at this point. So when they do go to 12 personnel situations, is he going to come off the field as the season goes on? And is Roma Dunze going to be on the field? Because he profiles as just a classic X receiver. He's a rookie. I don't know. Um, I just feel like that Keenan is a player at this point in his career because he doesn't win downfield, who needs a lot of volume to be a high-end fantasy scorer. And with DJ Moore and with these tight ends and with uh, Roma Dunze in the mix, I have a tough time getting him to the targets that I think he'd need from an efficiency perspective. So I actually have Odunze ranked straight up over Keenan Allen, just because I think if one of them is going to really make your season, it's probably Roma Dunze, which that is a non projections take. That's a, a like, Oh, my projections didn't come out this way, but subjectively, I think that this is probably what, what you, how you should draft. And so would you just to follow up on that Keenan Allen, you would, you would take like Terry McLaurin, Christian Kirk, Calvin Ridley over him. Yes. Yeah. All all three of those guys. Uh, Kirk Zay- is a uh, Kirk is a little, eh, but you know, just because Jags. But yeah, I, I, all those guys. Yeah. Zay Flowers. Yes, I would take Zay Flowers. Chris Godwin. Chris Godwin. Yeah, I would take I would take Chris. Godwin. Yeah, this is this is the th- interesting thing with uh, he said he set a yardage per game record last year. Keenan Allen, personal. I know. It's, but it's, but but was the but was the Chargers offense that good? You know when, uh, yeah. when he was doing that, I uh, I don't know. Yeah, eight catches a game. I don't know. It's tough because you you just don't you don't see the. And I look at I'm looking at fantasy numbers, and then I if I'm trying to dig it on a player, I go to reception perception to see you know where is there a fall off uh, on specific routes, beating man coverage, etc. To try to dig in and see if there if the cliff is there. Have you written up, Keenan Allen? Yes, I did okay. at the time of the trade, and I definitely think there there has been a decline, but he's still at a very good level. Um, like for Keenan Allen, it's he's got lower results than he typically would have, but for a normal NFL receiver, it's similar with the Steph Diggs thing, by the way. A normal NFL receiver having a reception perception profile that Steph Diggs put up in 2023, that'd be great, but he's not a normal receiver. He's Stephon Diggs. This is Keenan Allen. So that's why I say that this, the aging curves are really difficult. Um, I was, I've definitely look all disclosure here. I faded Keenan Allen last year and I look like an idiot for doing that. So um, I, sometimes you are one year too early. Uh, I'm trying to not be one year too late on the Keenan Allen hey, thing. Yeah. It's, it's not even that I think he's a bad pick. I just, typically like the upside of other receivers here. And I feel like if someone's going to get squeezed out in this target tree, I think it could be Keenan Allen, especially as the season goes on. Yeah. Since he's the oldest, uh, probably the most willing to, I guess he's, he's on a one year deal, right? So they're, yep. they're talking about, he's, he's, he's definitely invested in having a good season. Um, I just think wide receiver 32 is too low for him. It's, it reminds me of Fitzgerald uh, so much uh, just so I don't want to linger on Keenan Allen so much. Is this no, so, I, is, I, I, I just think he's, this is a great discussion about the, the difficulty of rankings because I don't think you can have DJ Moore where he goes and then also have Keenan Allen where he goes and right. then think that Roma Dunze is going to give you like anything from a consistent week-to-week perspective. Um, would, and, and that's why it's difficult. Would you be surprised if Keenan Allen plays 16 games if he leads this team in targets? No. No, okay. I wouldn't. And that that's why this is again, that's why this is difficult. And, yeah. and we also should acknowledge here that Caleb Williams is a really good prospect. He's coming into a really good situation for a guy taking probably an unprecedented situation for a guy taking number one overall because the Bears didn't earn that number one overall pick. The that was courtesy of the Carolina Panthers. But most rookie quarterbacks are bad. Like most rookie quarterbacks are not good, consistent right. starters in the NFL. I think we're a little overexcited based on what CJ Stroud gave us last year. So yeah, the Bears situation is definitely a really, really, really interesting one. I, speaking of rookie quarterbacks, the next one I wanted to ask you about was Jaden Daniels. I agree with you that I, I'm glad you put this because partly, John, fantasy football quarterback discussion is almost downright boring at this point. It's like, can you run? Great. We're interested. And uh, <laughs> like, why do, you, why do you have this guy ranked so high? Well, he can run. Great. Boring, boring, boring. Um, but I do think Jaden Daniels is worth the conversation. So why did you want to uh, have him as a tough player to rank this year? Yeah. So I kind of outlined my process uh, at the top. And when I press that initial button uh, to see where these 
guys are going, it's it was super interesting to see Jaden Daniels like in the top five. Same, at yeah, I know. <laughs> And especially because like, of the play calling data, right? With Cliff yeah, Kingsbury. Yeah. Yeah. And you're just like, whoa, I don't think I yeah. can, you know, get behind that. You know, you also see a video of him running and just getting lit up like <laughs> over and over again uh, at LSU. So you're worried about the injuries. But yes, it was, Jay Dallas is like, one, I'm excited to see him. I'm uh, excited. I drafted him in my mock yesterday, you know, QB 12 or 11 off the board. He's not somebody you have to really reach for in most of these drafts. Uh, you mentioned the rushing floor. Uh, I have a rookie quarterback model that is based off of their last season uh, in college. And most of the number, it's just basically a starting point for me with a lot of these players. And most of the uh, metrics, it's not that accurate. It's just like a starting point. But the one sure. thing it does really well is predict rushing yards for rookie quarterbacks. And he's projected for 44 rushing yards per game. Uh, so just that floor fantasy floor plus uh just a shout out to reception perception and Derek Klassen he was cited by Derek as the most accurate passer out of this group and I, and I know Derek has some reservations about his willingness to throw over the middle and uh but his his accuracy was tops in this class so he can throw the ball as well and uh Derek identified CJ Stroud last year as the most accurate passer of last year's class. So it's like, all right, he can run. He probably can throw, or at least is, if we can get him to throw over the middle and take those layups, he's going to put up a lot of fantasy points if he doesn't get himself killed on one of these runs. Yeah, I, again, I love that you highlighted this situation because this is another one in my projections article uh, that I talked about where the commanders are just really tricky to sort of solve here because Cliff Kingsbury calls the type of offenses that are just pure fantasy bait. Right. Uh, even if it doesn't end up working out, I'm sure you and I have maybe been too confident in these Cardinals players at times because of this. And then even if you look back at Dan Quinn's history and, you know, it's tough to take like what what was going on in Dallas. How much does Dan Quinn have to do with that from an offensive perspective? But even like several of his offenses at the end of his time with the Atlanta Falcons. You know, obviously, we know the Kyle Shanahan uh, tenure was really successful. Matt Ryan won MVP, but they were typically like one of the some of the most pass heavy offenses um, around. Again, how much of that is something we can carry over here? I'm I'm not 100 percent sure. But what I do know is that these players are interesting. And, you know, you know, I'm a longtime Terry McLaurin guy. I think John Dotson is underrated and you know, Jaden Daniels, like you mentioned, accurate quarterback. He sh- if he if he can have a passing component to his game, he can probably get into that top five fantasy ceiling. But some of the way he, you know, the pressure to sack ratio with him, the offensive line in Washington, that gives me pause from going all in on Jaden Daniels. Uh, so where do you actually, from a bottom line perspective, have him ranked? I have him at 12, and I was, like I said, I was in a mock on our podcast yesterday, and I took him over Brock Purdy, uh, who I have at 11. Yeah. Uh, and there was a couple of reasons for that. One is this Ayuk scuttlebutt stuff. Totally fair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> which worries me a little bit. But I also thought it, I really just wanted to talk about Jaden Daniels more than Brock Purdy uh, on the podcast. So that was yeah. it. So I, I have Good for him content, at 12. baby. <laughs> yeah, I have him at 12, and I, and I do remember as the initial ADP and we were talking about rookie fever. It was almost the opposite with Jaden Daniels because I, the initial ADP on, uh, or general consensus on Jaden Daniels was like QB 16. Yeah. So I felt like I was high on him. And then all of a sudden a month later, you know, ADP is back up to where I've got him ranked. Um, and you mentioned Terry McLaurin. I do, I do worry a little bit that this with Curtis Samuel leaving that this receiver room is a little bit, thin it's light yeah uh and like something that can take down a player like Jaden daniels even if he has all the fancy upside in the world is if like terry mclaurin god forbid pulls a hamstring and is out for oh. six games or something and then you're looking at dotson as the wide receiver one you don't you have zach Ertz as your tight end or ben sinat sinat uh luke mccaffrey diami brown uh olamid zacchaeus i don't know why i'm trying to pronounce all these names but this is the what we're getting into you did a good job. yeah thank you so we're getting into some some I'm not I don't want to call them goofballs because they're NFL receivers and they're a lot better at what they do than you know anything I've ever done. But they're not they're not going to support him if there's an injury to somebody like De- Terry McLaurin. So that's the worry. I also think that uh, Cliff Kingsbury might go kind of run heavy or more run heavy than he probably wants to 
Um, I think it was a 54.4% pass run split two years ago in Cliff Kingsbury's pet play calling. I don't remember when that was. 60.5% in his last season as a play caller. So I, I, I went with the more run heavy because also you're getting to get some, a lot of Jaded Daniels runs. So I don't have them super pass heavy. I have them about league average. Uh, even if the team's not going to be very good and they're going to have to throw more than they would like to, that might be the way for for Daniels to really kind of blow up some of the... I mean, he might be one of these like garbage time heroes too if this team is not good and he's scoring a lot of fantasy points in the fourth quarter as they're just trying to, to get back into the game. Yeah, I ultimately had them kind of middle of the pack and pass attempts for a lot of the same reasons that you did. I, I did have them running a lot of plays, though. That's where I ended up kind of um, getting oh, yeah. a boost for some of these commanders players. And yeah, if Terry McLaurin's healthy, I think actually the the targets being rather concentrated between McLaurin and Dotson and sprinkling some of the tight ends and maybe Austin Eckler out of the backfield. I actually think that can probably be better for a rookie quarterback if those guys are healthy and on the field. Uh, I don't love it when we get a guy in there and, you know, let's spread the ball around and let's kind of you could like with Sam Howell last year, man, you could see the smoke coming out of his ears at times. because I think they were trying to do too much from uh, from a drop back perspective there with the Washington Commanders last season. So I, I think da- I ultimately ended up D- Daniels at QB 11, the very bottom of tier three. But I think if again, if the passing component comes together. This is what's tough because I think he could launch himself into tier two among quarterbacks. That's why he's a little bit of a difficult rank. Um, You touched a little bit on the Dolphins running backs. So I kind of want to ask you a little bit uh, about the Titans running back room. I'm glad you brought this up too, John, because I almost like don't care about the Titans running backs. Um, I haven't really been aggressive drafting them. I haven't really been aggressive ranking them i i don't really know what to say so i'm hoping yeah. you can bring some clarity to this situation well you you asked who is tough to rank you didn't ask who i was interested in uh, <laughs> or <laughs> trying to draft <laughs> like i with with these two with pollard and uh ty j spears uh in in what i think is going to be a much more pass heavy offense just given the change at coordinator there um I'm not I, like I'm not getting a lot of either of these guys. I've, I've usually already kind of buttoned up my running back room, or I'm going to take some guys later, and I, I just kind of avoid Pollard and, uh, and Spears because I think they're both pretty good, um, and they are very much going to eat into each other's uh, <laughs> upside. Uh, so there just is unless unless one of these guys gets injured, there just isn't a lot of even high end RB two upside. Uh, for, on a weekly basis in a, in a manner that you can trust. Um, Cause it's fine in best ball, I suppose, because you know, you're kind of playing the whole long season and maybe one of these guys goes down and the other one kind of blows up. But on a weekly basis, if you have Tony Pollard on your team uh, and he's getting 11 touches or 12 touches a game, are you going to feel comfortable starting him in any given week? Um, it's almost useless having a player with that sort of workload, unless it's a, an HM who's getting eight yards of carry uh, it's just not startable. So I just sort of avoided yeah. uh, the Tennessee two running backs. I think it's difficult from a projection standpoint because we just don't know who they're going to favor. And if it's just going to be a rotation, it might literally be Pollard starts and then they just start rotating series. And then maybe in the fourth quarter, if one of them's hot, uh, they get a, they get a few extra touches. So it, it's going to be very difficult, I think, even on a weekly basis to project this unless some one of them like wins the RB1 job and starts to get 60 65% of the touches. Which I would be surprised if that happens. Um, maybe you know it's certainly within the range of outcomes, but I feel like only an injury will really clarify this situation. Which is why it's tough to all out avoid these players too. Because I think if Pollard went down or Spears went down, I don't think they're getting Hassan Haskins or Julius Chestnut or any of these other packs on the depth chart involved here. I think it would then be just like, oh yeah, Tajay Spears is playing eighty percent of the snaps, yeah. or Tony Pollard's playing eighty percent of the snaps. And we know with Tony Pollard and probably Tajay Spears fits into this archetype of player, that those are not necessarily like true workhorse backs you want to be playing eighty percent of the snaps. We kind of saw this with Pollard last season, but even Pollard last season would way out kick whatever Pollard's ADP is now if he was the standalone guy. So I do find them to be very, very difficult players to rank, very kind of, again, whatever players to draft. If the first thing I say is this guy can access his upside due to injury, well, you could say that about almost any running back. So right. that's why they I kind of have them in the blah range of running backs. And, and I, John, I'm sure you feel the same way. I just wish one of these guys was like a banger, and I wish one of these guys – 
was a space back. But neither is a banger. Neither is really a true, true, true space back. They kind of more so lean that way. So that, that lack of clarity just makes it a completely weird situation to try to, to solve. Uh, similarly is the Denver Broncos running back room, John. Again, is this, does this fit into the, yeah, you don't want to talk about it. You don't want to draft these guys, but it is a difficult room to rank. Because if it is, I'll, I'll allow you to just bypass talking about this and, and we could talk about one of these other ones you threw out here. Yeah, you, you got to learn this about me. I take your questions literally. Who are some of the toughest teams to project or players to rank this season? And uh, yeah, I'm just telling you who they, who they are. Uh, Denver, <laughs> I think there's probably, um, I mean, they, they are interesting from a, I feel a little more confident in maybe you you draft a Javante uh uh, Williams, uh, especially with the kind of the drumbeat that's starting, that he is looking really good. Uh, maybe he's in, in camp. It seems like he's making plays. Uh, and then you've got a bunch of guys behind him with maybe specific roles. And, you know, I think the dynasty folks get really excited about the rookie. And you got some, you know, it's probably going to end up being Samaj P. Ryan as the backup. And Jaleel <laughs> McGoffin's there catching passes as well. So, you know, if one of those guys gets cut, then that makes it a little bit easier. But it does seem like Javante is starting to sort of gain a little bit of steam. Maybe his ADP floor is going to uh, solidify, uh, and he might get taken ahead of some of these, uh, you know, guys like Devin Singletary, maybe Najee Harris, uh, who's in a time timeshare, but could see a lot of touches. Um, Zamir White, uh, kind of that that crew. Um, you could see Javante start to, you know, that low end uh, RB two tier start to to move up a little bit uh, as people start to remember the type of player he was as a rookie. Uh, he was real good in all the tackle breaking uh, metrics and stuff, and just kind of had a down year last year. But it was understandable coming off the coming off the injury. Yeah, Javante Williams right now, 98th overall player, running back 33 off the board in Yahoo drafts. You know, he's behind some players, as you mentioned, some, these Titans running backs, these pure timeshare guys. Um, he's he's behind Devin Singletary, Zach Moss, again, Zach Moss, another potentially timeshare guy. You know, Williams, certainly he's going to lose some snaps, to some of these players along the way that that is for sure in, in Sean Payton's backfield. But I think he's got a lot more upside than his current ADP suggests. So that is a good name to bring up as well. Uh, you know, I, I know we're going to talk about wide receivers in a couple of weeks, John, but it, let's talk about the Buffalo wide receiver room here real quick, because that's another situation that you mentioned is a very difficult player and team to project. And that will also transition us to our next topic as well, because I know you have Curtis Samuel ranked 10 spots higher than consensus. I might be ha- You might have known me a little too long, John Paulson, to be doing something like that. But uh, Buffalo wide receiver room, very much a a overhaul from what we've seen previously very much like a philosophical overhaul potentially going on on offense there how did you end up statting out these buffalo wide receivers yeah this is a a, a tough room uh you did not put this in bold so i was a little disappointed because i wanted to talk to you about curtis samuel and his upside in this offense and what how you think this is going to to sort of shake out they've got i could resist I <laughs> they, they, <laughs> they've got uh you know Keon Coleman entering and he's the un, he's the great unknown right and then you've got Curtis Samuel who I name checked you in my in my uh, draft note and I said this is a longtime Matt Harmon favorite and when longtime Matt Harmon favorites uh have get promotions or have opportunity ahead of them I definitely wake up and start drafting them uh, a little bit earlier because he is a talented uh route runner and can get open I think he'll be uh Josh Allen's best friend uh, in this offense, he does have a built-in r- rapport with Khalil Shakir, who has shown some flashes here and there. And I guess he's having mm-hmm. a pretty good camp. Um, I can't remember if you liked him coming out of college. I, th- I feel I like did, he yeah. did. Uh, and then they've got, I guess, Matt Collins. I, I saw a tweet about Matt Collins as, a, I guess, a deep threat. Uh, they got K- KJ Hamler. MVS is apparently fading already. Uh, so this is a wide open receiver room. Tons and tons of targets available. And we can usually capitalize in these situations if we can, f- you know, find the players that are going to step into those bigger roles. Uh, I-, I love the fact that Curtis Samuel uh, is versatile. They might hand him the ball a few times. He's being reunited with his offensive coordinator, who got a wide receiver twenty-five season out of him, fantasy wise. Uh, he's going, I think, wide receiver forty-five, something like that. Um, if I remember correctly, he's going in the 40s. If I, if unless I'm crazy, I just think it's there's too much value on the board with a, a known player like Curtis Samuel. I don't think he has like top 10 upside, 
Um, I don't think that you're necessarily going to get a lot of players with that sort of upside in the wide receiver four ranks. So I'm happy to take him there if he's got wide receiver two upside. Uh, I think he had a thousand total yards in that season uh, with the mm-hmm. with the offensive coordinator. So the question is, you know, how many targets will Keon Coleman demand early? Is he going to be a target hog, or is this going to be a pick your poison for Josh Allen, uh, more of a scheme oriented offense and just kind of you know what the Packers are running, uh, where you know they're not necessarily featuring any one player. Uh, different guys are going to pop their heads up here and there. Uh, I think overall, my favorite player in this offense is Curtis Samuel. Uh, in terms of who I'm trying to target in every every single draft, I, I'm trying to get him in the eighth, ninth round uh, as my wide receiver four. Yeah, I also have Curtis Samuel ranked seven spots ahead of consensus. He's the wide receiver fifty one in Yahoo Ooh. drafts right now, one hundred fifteenth overall player. I do agree with you that the the final point that you made there, it, my my thought is that this is going to be a pick your poison offense for Josh Allen. I don't think one guy is going to have a twenty four percent target share or something like that. I think, I think it's an intentional move away from that in Buffalo at this point. I don't even think Kincaid is necessarily going to be that much of a target hog either. I think they're going to spread this thing around. And I, I'm so glad you brought up Matt Collins too, buddy, because I wrote about this Bills passing game. Probably about a month, maybe more than that uh, ago, and the the final section was, look, I know none of you want to hear this. Go ahead and skip this section, but one of Mac Hollins, MVS, or Chase Claypool is going to play more than you think, and it's been clear Mac Hollins in camp so far. He is going to be that sacrificial X receiver. He's not going to get a ton of targets, but he's going to play on the line, and he's going to allow them to do all these fun things with Samuel, with Shakir, who's an off-the-line slot player. And it's going to, I think, be good for Keon Coleman to be in those situations, too. I just wonder if we could get a Chiefs situation here, John, where week one comes out and none of these guys have run more than 70% of the routes and it's very, very spread out. And in that situation, like you draft Curtis Samuel, wide receiver 51 or a little bit ahead of that. Who cares? Like, it's not going to make or break your season. It's not a big deal. Um, But it could be ending. It could end up in a situation where that's that's problematic for projections on a week to week basis. The good thing is that I think all these players are good to some degree. Not in not in like Kansas City last year, all those guys were not good. So that that would be the difference in the two situations. They also have two tight ends that they want to play. You mentioned Kincaid, but Dawson Knox, they love him. You know, if they're running twelve, that's gonna <laughs> who's sitting? Who's who's in the game and who's who's on the sideline uh you know, playing 60, 50, 60 percent of the snaps. Not to mention too, you know, and again, this is something I wrote up in that piece uh, from a couple of, about a month ago or whatever. James Cook, also pretty involved in the passing game. He had a two point four average depth of target last year. Uh, led all players at the position with at least fifty targets. Only Cook and Saquon Barkley uh, have an average depth of targets north of one point oh, um, uh, two point oh in the last two seasons. So. He's the receiving weapon for them as well, so it is definitely a messy situation to project. All right, we're going to take one final break. When we come back, I'm going to get a few names from John, players that he has higher than consensus, besides the great Curtis Samuel, right after this. All right, John, I'm going to ask you about a couple of running backs here up towards the top of the draft. Kyron Williams, Derrick Henry, you've got these two guys ranked ahead of consensus. Let's start with Kyron Williams because – I know what people are thinking when they see Kyron Williams name. Oh, yeah, he was awesome last year, but they just drafted Blake Corum. What do I do about that, John Paulson? You're the rankings guy. You you got this guy ranked ahead of consensus. So uh, why are you still in on Kyron Williams despite the drafting of Blake Corum and obviously some of the injury risk that he showed last season? Well, number one, I think it's pretty wild, like the disparity from analyst to analyst, like who the number four running back is after the top three. Uh, running backs like you could make an argument for about six seven different guys uh at that spot so that the rb like the second tier is really interesting to me and it's going to throw a lot of people in drafts i believe but looking at kyron williams he wasn't just like i mean he did handle 21.7 of the team's 28 backfield touches touches in his 12 games played so it wasn't like he was getting 90 percent or 95 percent of the touches he was seeing about three quarters of the touches which is not an outlandish Super heavy. I mean, it is 21.7 touches, so that's heavy, but it's not an outlandish number in terms of share of the backfield touches. So even if he uh, falls into the 18 to 19 range or 64 to 68% of the team's backfield touches just based on what they did last year, he's still looking at 16 and a half, 17 and a half, uh, half PPR fantasy points. And that still would have been good enough to have him as the RB2 behind Christian McCaffrey 
which is where he finished last year. So I, I feel like, you know, RB7, I think, is the ADP I saw. I don't know where he's going in Yahoo, but I think he's a really solid pick in that early second round if you want to go running back there as opposed to, to drafting a receiver or a tight end. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of warming up to this as well. He's the running back eight in uh, Yahoo uh, as well. So I think he is... Look, when he's out on the field, he's going to be a difference maker in fantasy. And the difference makers in fantasies are just in fantasy are just so rare. Okay. So I I think he's a very interesting bet in that second round range. I've definitely warmed up to him as a second round pick for sure. Um, I'm just curious where you end up then on Blake Corum. Like, is he still a guy that you, if you don't have Kyron Williams, would you take him? Uh, just because I do think if Williams misses time, I think they're just going to drop him. Blake Corum right right into that role that that Williams would be vacating. Yeah, I have him with a pretty you know Corum with a pretty significant role because you you know if 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 you get he's already got maybe six seven touches just based on what the backups were doing last year for the Rams. But if you add now three or four touches uh, from Kyron Williams, and I did see another news report today that Kyron is like looking forward to being you know being uh, having them limit his workload a bit to keep him fresh. Yeah. So we are going to see a, a, a decline in touches for Kyron Williams as long as, long as Quorum is available to play. Uh, I think Quorum is like premier uh, handcuff type player. I don't, you know, I don't mind handcuffing if if the player is the best player at that pick, and I already have Kyron Williams, then I don't mind taking Quorum if it's it makes sense. Uh, I don't avoid handcuffs for that reason. I don't go out of my way usually to to handcuff. Uh, either but uh you know i run into some situations lately where i'm like well this is the best player on the board and has upside if he is the if the player ahead of him gets hurt oh i have the player ahead of him i don't really it doesn't bother me that i would have two players from the same team so uh, i've got him at 39 uh right now and he probably should you know i got gus edwards at 40 he might need to be up a spot or two but um you know quorum is definitely a guy who could uh make or break your season if there is an injury to karen Let's talk Derrick Henry going in that same range. Um, actually, a little bit higher in Yahoo drafts. He's the 14th overall player running back uh, six, a couple spots ahead of Kyron Williams. I, everybody seems to be in on Derrick Henry, John Paulson, which is why I, I've been getting nervous about it because it's just when we're all in agreement on something, it definitely is going to go wrong, especially when it's an aging run. Like we, everybody always usually wants to fade aging running backs, but it's universally. It seems that the exception is being made for Derrick Henry, who I love. I love Derrick Henry. I love the idea with them, uh, with the Ravens. So is there any way that this can't go wrong, or do you? Or is this any way? Is there any way this can go wrong, John? Am I just totally fearful of the consensus building here? No, I. You know, you're if you if you want a guy who's ageist and is going to write off a, a, a running back at thir- you know age thirty uh, who has who has built like a <laughs> Mack truck, yeah. uh, like yes, he could get injured, and that's going to be the way it goes wrong. I think that's the only way it goes wrong. If he if he does, you know, go down with a foot injury or pulls a hamstring or something weird, uh, knocks him out for several games, because on paper this is a, a match made in heaven. Uh, Henry, his his stats were still like his advanced stats were still really good. He had the number six rushing grade at PFF. He was number eleven in uh, yards after contact per attempt, sixteenth in broken tackles per attempt, so still really solid. Uh, Tennessee running backs averaged two point two yards before contact last year and Ravens running backs averaged 3.2 yards per contact or yards before contact last year, which if you think about it, um, that's just number one, it's just adding a yard per carry for, for Henry, but you're also giving Derrick Henry an extra yard to build up speed. Uh, and if, if they, I know they lost some players, but they, it seems like the Ravens just sort of reload it at, on the offensive line. So as long as that yeah. offensive line is, you know, 80 90 percent of what it was last year this is going to be a big improvement for for uh, derrick henry um you know he's not going to catch a lot of passes they've got other players uh, in that offense to do that you know i am a proponent of giving him one target per quarter just to see what happens because if he catches it and gets uh you know ahead of steam going you might be looking at a touchdown and I, let me just say this to you and if you disagree let me know but he is legit 20 touchdown upside in this offense and it, it might be 20 rushing touchdowns i don't know but this, this offense has averaged 15 running back touchdowns since 2020 so 
there's no reason that Henry can't meet that and and perhaps ex- exceed it. In in my view. Yeah, and by the way, you're not the first person that said that to me, and that's my concern. <laughs> Which is a stupid concern, uh, but the fact that everybody does seem to want to break the look. If, if there's a guy that we should break the rules for, it should be Derrick Henry because he has already broken the rules, right? He, like running backs, as you said, should not be built like that. That is not normal for running backs to do that. We've already seen him thrive at an at an older age. Last season, this is a much much better ecosystem. Yeah, the Ravens' offensive line might take a step back. Because they've had three starters leave. One of their starters, Ronnie Stanley, who's returning, is definitely a shell of himself because he used to be a true all-pro player. Now he's a guy they're kind of concerned about from an injury perspective. They rotate him a little bit. Whatever. All that is still better than whatever was going on in Tennessee last year. So I have definitely found myself ranking Derrick Henry ahead of consensus. I'm with you on this one. One that I, I thought was interesting because I've heard plenty of people talk positive about Derrick Henry. I haven't heard a lot of people, John Paulson, want to talk up DeAndre Swift, uh, but you have him as a player you have ranked ahead of consensus here, and he feels like the most boring running back pick on the board, John. So, I don't know. Maybe you can get my juices flowing here about DeAndre Swift. I don't you know, I, I don't understand the the anti-Swift, like, oh, he's boring or what. Like, he's a, isn't he, like, a talented, really talented running back? He's got the number zero. He's sure. got a... a black visor like he looks like darth vader like <laughs> well to me, the zero like, does nothing for me i i don't like the zero i'm anti-zero i'm just gonna get that on the record I, as soon as calvin ridley was zero last year i was like oh that's cold Nah, yeah it, it, <laughs> it, it, it makes my blood cold i don't like it all right well that that kind of <laughs> undercuts my argument a little bit he, you, know, I mean, he, you don't you don't have to you don't have to you don't have to indulge that that is one of my boomer takes okay that, that okay. the zero thing is bad you don't have to agree with me on that you know, he was uh, Swift was RB seventeen last season, uh, and that was uh, you know as the lead back for most of this. You know, he started behind Kenneth Gainwell at the start of last year, and then won that pretty uh, quickly. Won that job pretty quickly. Two hundred sixty eight touches, twelve hundred and sixty three total yards. Um, didn't score many touchdowns due to the Jalen Hurts push push brotherly shove. Um, so coming into this offense, um, I do think he's. I mean, they gave him a pretty contract, so that signals to me that they wanted him and have a plan for him. Uh, mm-hmm. I think Khalil Herbert's probably better than people give him credit for. Rashawn Johnson's fine. Uh, those two could, you know, push Swift for some touches here and there, but I think Swift will be that 60%, 65% lead back in this offense, given that contract and given his talent. Um, so he's going, I don't know. You tell me in Yahoo. I've seen him in the low-end RB2, high-end RB3 type rankings you know sixth round i just feel like deandre swift in a what should be a pretty good offense lots of um running lanes with all these receivers if 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 shane waldron can figure it out uh he's going to be productive uh and he can catch passes as well and there is i mean last season it's hard to look at that because it's change in coordinator but the running backs combined for 72 catches um last year so if if that sort of holds then swift does have like 40 or 50 catch upside and he does have the ability to catch the ball and run the ball i think he's a I don't know. I, I don't get the you know blah sort of vibes around DeAndre Swift. I mean, I I got him in the sixth round of our mock yesterday, and that's you know, a pretty exciting pick for me. Yeah, running by twenty five in Yahoo, seventy eighth overall player off the board. Um, yeah, that's fine. Again, it's like it's fine. I don't know what it is. I I can't quite pinpoint it. Um, maybe it's because I am so excited about the passing game, but to push back on my own stupid feeling about this. I remember when Josh Jacobs signed with the Packers, I remember thinking, well, you know what? It's really hard to crack that receiving room. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to attack that one through four. They also have two good tight ends, but I do expect it to be a good offense. So maybe the guy I'll just draft into is Josh Jacobs. I feel very similarly about the Bears, right? It's a tough receiving room to crack. We just talked about that. Um, I don't think they're going to be quite as good as the Packers on offense this year, but I think they have potential to outkick expectations if Caleb Williams is really good. Maybe I should just want to draft into the starting running back if I can't get into the um if I can't get into the receiver room and I can't quite figure that out. So I don't know. You're you're challenging a little bit of my feelings on this because I guarantee you this might be like the first time we've had an in depth DeAndre Swift discussion on the show since he signed with the Bears. I you know he, where would where was he going when he was with the Lions? Oh, much higher like, than running back twenty five. Yeah, it seems like he was at a third or fourth round pick. You know. You're getting a Bears discount, but maybe this Bears offense is going to take a, a big step forward. I don't know. I 
I like it. And uh, I like this tier of running backs too. Uh, you know, if you are going to go with a hero plan, a hero running back plan, or a zero RB plan, there's a bunch of cool dudes here, in my opinion, in the sixth, seventh, eighth round where you're getting lots of touches that I can't remember a, a year where this many touches were available, predictable touches that were, were available in the middle rounds. All right. One wide receiver I want to ask you about before we wrap up with a couple of tight ends here. Josh Palmer, seven spots ahead of consensus. Um, I, I've kind of come around on Josh Palmer a little bit. I think he's a solid NFL receiver after I did not think he had a good rookie season in reception perception. Um, I'm interested in hearing your take on Palmer specifically, John, because I think the Chargers offense is going to be better than people expect. Talked about this on an episode of Football 301 with Nate Tice last week. Um I, I know they're definitely going to lean into the run game, no doubt about it. But this is still Justin Herbert, and it should be maybe not a voluminous passing game, but I do think it will be an efficient passing game. Um, so Josh Palmer has been a guy you've been gravitating to here. Yeah, and w- maybe you could tell me his ADP at, at, at Yahoo at some point here uh, in this discussion. But it, it seems like he's going really, really low for a guy who's very likely going to be the wide receiver two or perhaps the wide receiver one for the Chargers this year. I don't think it's a sure thing that Lad McConkey comes in and leads the team in receiving. I, I like Lad McConkey, I, you know, based on your write-up of him as well. Like, he's a really good route runner. Wasn't the most productive guy in college, so that just gives me a little bit of pause. But I think those two are going to be wide receiver one, wide receiver two in some order. Uh, not a whole lot of talent i don't know uh route running talent get open talent you know down the down the line in that receiver room so i don't think these two are going to be under much pressure they're going to play a lot of snaps both of them so just looking at palmer's season last year and, and people just i think write off guys like this even though uh he he was buried behind Keen, you know Keenan allen one of the best receivers in the last five years uh, mike williams really productive receiver when healthy just doesn't get care about his body so he was sometimes with some of these crazy catches he was making but um, you know, I, I looked at your, you know, I was looking at uh, reception perception to tr- sort of try to figure out Palmer, his route running. I'm interested if you do anything for this year, but la- last one I saw was his rookie season. He did have above average set success rates on five of the 10 routes that you charted, but I think overall you were not uh, too impressed with, with it as a rookie in his rookie season. But that's something to build upon, I think. Um, and if you look at what he did last year, he had. Uh, several games. It was just, it's hard to pull all these splits because Keenan missed some time. Mike totally. Williams missed some time. But um, of Palmer's 10 games, Mike Williams played in three. Keenan Allen played in four. Palmer averaged 74 yards in the four games he played with Allen and without Williams, which sort of might mirror the McConkey Palmer 1 2. Um, and uh, one of those games was cut short to injury in the three games he played without both Allen and Williams Palmer posted 113 yards 47 yards 44 yards a 68 yard average so without Mike Williams Palmer played at a 73 catch 1209 yard uh, 2.4 touchdown pace and those are low end wide receiver two numbers now this is a different offense Uh, Kellen Moore is gone we got Greg Roman in Uh, we've got uh, Herbert with a Justin Herbert with a foot injury, so there's a lot of things up in the air here. But I think Palmer is capable of being that number two option, perhaps that number one option, uh, and getting him at this point in the draft, uh, a guy who has produced at a 1,200 yard pace without Mike Williams. Uh, I think it's a, a good value pick. Josh Palmer, wide receiver, 64. Wow, in Yahoo drafts, um, that's yeah, like t- 10 spot. That's 10 spots behind uh, like consensus rankings, and I have him at wide receiver 50. So I'm, yeah. I'm ahead of consensus a little bit. I'm definitely ahead of this ADP on Palmer. I think I have a few games logged to Palmer from last year. I think he's grown a lot from that rookie season. I don't think he has future superstar trajectory. Almost nobody that scores as low as he did in year one in reception perception has superstar trajectory, but you can get back to being like a useful NFL player, and that's kind of where I think Josh Palmer is. I think he's a useful NFL receiver. Probably best as a three, but I think he can masquerade as a two in this situation. I definitely have Lad McConkey ranked higher, but I have these guys in the same tier, and that is what that is definitely way ahead of, of ADP. I, I will make you this prediction, jo- uh, uh, John. Josh Palmer currently, and this probably goes up by the time we get to the end of August, but currently he has been drafted in only eight percent of Yahoo drafts that have happened. They play the Raiders in Week One. 
I guarantee you, Josh Palmer, if that if that holds up, he's only drafted eight percent of leagues. They play the Raiders in Week One. They probably beat the Raiders in Week One. Josh Palmer will like lead every waiver wire article. Like, wow, this guy, Josh Palmer. What is it? Yeah, yeah. So I, that is my prediction. If that if that number holds, I, l- I love it, and I, I agree with you. I think McConkey should go ahead of him, uh, just from the uh, kind of the unknown box, uh, and then the route running that you that you charted with McConkey. Like that upside's there, uh, but Palmer. 64 or 67 whatever it was yeah he's definitely a top 50 receiver for me given the the like and this is another you know to circle back to the projections process somebody has to catch the ball and it's up to us to figure out who the best players are there and i think it's pretty easy to determine in, in the chargers receiver room who the two best players are so that's gonna that's gonna boost palmer into draftable range i, I think he's a great like wide receiver five wide receiver four just to have and you might even want to start him week one against those raiders it's not DJ Chark and Quentin Johnson um, right. that are the best receivers in that in that particular room. Final two players I want to talk to you about, and you can be quick on this one because one of them is Taysom Hill, which you're just a sicko for even wanting to put Taysom Hill into the stock. Uh, but the real one I want to ask about tight end, you know, nominal tight end Taysom Hill, tight end John uh, Johnu Smith. You have him 16 spots ahead of consensus, which um, – I think it's super fascinating. You know, Dalton Del Don made a case for Johnu Smith uh, early on in the podcast here. He has an ADP of 219 uh, and he, tight end 24. I am I am also a little bit ahead of that on Johnu Smith, maybe not 16 spots ahead. But, um, yeah, I think Johnu Smith is pretty interesting in this Miami Dolphins offense. Clearly, you you agree. Yeah, just to touch on Taysom Hill, it, it looks like he's going to have the same role, maybe even a bigger role. It sounds like they're leaning into the <laughs> Taysom Hill uh, <laughs> experience. So I want to highlight him because he's going like tight end twenty five in our in our multi side ADP, and he really he's a top twelve tight end, this, especially this God year. Oh yeah, just if you look at the, if, you know, it depends on if you're a PPR full PPR, he doesn't catch a lot of passes. But if you're in standard or half PPR, Taysom Hill is a starting tight end. So if you play in a, in a league, he's almost like the answer key. If you play in a league where he's tight end eligible and he's going that yeah. late, you can punt the position and you're going to get some passing touchdowns out of your and rushing touchdowns out of your tight end. Um, I so should ju- I should note he is he is and I, there's nothing I hate more than getting into the freaking positional eligibility um, discussions, but I should note that he is a quarterback on Yahoo. So only a quarterback. I think he is only a quarterback right. on Yahoo. If I if I am looking at this correctly, so to, but I'm not. Look, we're we're not going to be stupid on this podcast and think that only Yahoo fantasy users are listening to this podcast. Right. So yes, right, right, as right. a matter of fact, I have Taysom Hill in a dynasty league where he is tight end eligible. So <laughs> and, and you no, you would you would be disgusted, listener, as to how many times I have played him over Kyle Pitts <laughs> in the last two years, two three yeah, years in this I, dynasty league. So hey. They are, quote, leaning into the, ex- the Taysom Hill experience, uh, end quote, oh, from a BYU. Baby. So just FYI, uh, be, be ready for that. Uh, Janu Smith is, and this is a weird year for tight end. I don't know if you feel the same way, but usually there's like two or three or four guys in the tight end two ranks that I'm like young guys that are getting into a bigger mm-hmm. role that I'm really excited about. And it just isn't that way this year. Like I, I look at all these guys and there's just reasons to be down on them as opposed to being up on them or being high on them, like Cole Komet or Dalton Schultz or whoever. There's, there isn't that Jake Ferguson for me like it was last year, except for, and I don't know that he's going to get the consistent weekly targets uh, just due to the uh, way the offense is set up and the other players available. But Johnny Smith going to the Dolphins, really excited about this uh, for him and for Mike McDaniel and to see him play in this offense. He was a tight end 19 and half PPR last year, the 15th most receiving yards among among tight ends. Uh, 582 yards, and that was as the tight end to whatever next to Kyle Pitts in uh, that donkey's offense in uh, Atlanta, uh, the donkey play caller. I won't na- mention his name. Uh, he's an amazing uh, athlete, uh, Johnny Smith. If you go to player profile, you can see like where he tra- tracks his terms, in terms of his athleticism. And I think the people are drafting him at tight end 26 or whatever because the, the Dolphins just haven't utilized the tight end position for several years. He only got, you know, 414. Mike McDaniel only got 414 yards total from Durham Smythe and Julian Hill in 2023. Just 491 from Mike Kosecki. He was a pretty athletic tight end, receiving tight end in Durham Smythe the year before. 
So he, he doesn't have this reputation of being a tight end whisperer, but I thought it was a really interesting quote from his press conference when he was asked about John o. Smith's role in his offense. And he said, quote, um, some people think that just whatever it was, it will always be. And number one, I love the like the philosophical quote. Yeah. Like just having a head coach speak like that. I love that. But then also like that makes sense. Like as fantasy prognosticators, we feel like our best frame of reference is last season or the you know year before or the play callers last season or whatever. But they went out and got Johnny Smith for a reason. And he's coyly telling us, oh, coyly is that the right word? In a coy way, he's telling us he's going to be used. And I think given this offense, he's probably going to be a low target, four or five target tight end, which is not what we usually want in fantasy. But I think he's going to be really up there in terms of his efficiency, yards per route run, yards per, maybe not yards per route run, but yards per target, yards per yards per catch are going to be way up there. And he does give them uh, more of a um, thread around the goal line than t- you know, smaller receivers, Tyree Kill. Jalen Wall is not a big guy. If you're punting the position, and are just like, I don't want David and Joku. I don't, I don't trust Bowers in the Raiders offense, whatever. I think you can wait forever in your draft and get Johnny Smith. Don't wait too long because you know, you and I are sitting here talking about him. But <laughs> he he could he could be serviceable tight end, low end tight end one. Uh, you know, I would probably favor Taysom Hill if he's eligible, oh, but <laughs> But I think Johnny Smith's a you know a tremendous value at the position, and he'd be like he's great in best ball because he's number two or number three tight end, and he you know in a regular redraft league not as confident in him being a tight end one for you, but I think he has that sort of upside. Yeah, a lot of the usage that you outlined there, low targets but high yield, red zone yards after catch opportunities in wide open space, which you should have in the Miami Dolphins offense. That sounds like some of his best days in Tennessee. And frankly, it sounds like some of the moments that were pretty good last year at Atlanta. So um, when I remember when Dalton first brought up when we did like a pressing questions episode, what's John o. Smith's role with the Dolphins? I was kind of like, what are we, what bro, what are we talking about? But then <laughs> I think the more I've thought about it since then, and that Mike McDaniel quote, I saw that too. Um, it's definitely got my antennas up. So I'm really glad you uh, brought this one up here. John Paulson, absolutely dominant performance. Appreciate you, buddy. Uh, tell the people where they can find you, what you're working on as we Ro- launch rapidly ahead to week one yeah some some of your listeners may not know may not know me uh 444 underscore john on on twitter i'm still calling it twitter and my rule on that is if i type in twitter.com and i don't go to x or whatever it's you want to call it now then i'll stop calling it twitter but as long as i type in, type in t- twitter that's just that's my boomer take right browser now bro- browser yeah. bros yeah yeah anybody <laughs> anytime you can do a desktop related take john that is a big time boomer move <laughs> Uh, 44 underscore John on the Twitter and uh, I'm going to be releasing my draft day strategy article this week uh, by Wednesday by tomorrow and I had a 44 stats that you must know uh, before your fantasy draft article that came out last week uh, just everything was every all my works over at 444.com so check it out and I'll be on John's show next week talking wide receivers right um, uh, we've got weeks, that locked in well I, dude, don't ask me about my schedule. So <laughs> do, do, do not ask me to know my schedule off the top of my head. Uh, at some point in the next few weeks, I will be on John's show talking wide receivers. So make sure you keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, that's going to do it for us today. If you enjoyed this episode, how the hell could you not enjoy this episode? Like the show, subscribe, rate, review on Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, all those things. I would take it as a personal favor. A real, I'd have a real debt of gratitude to you, if, but only if you leave a five star review. Okay, only five star reviews get a debt of gratitude from me. You can also send us an email, fantasy mailbag at yahoosports.com. Remember, written emails are good, voice memos, videos are even better. We are going to continue rankings week tomorrow with Ben Gretsch, electric episode ahead for an in depth conversation on the difference between projections versus rankings and what fantasy analysis gets wrong. I can't wait for that. Until then, we're out.